like, like taking pictures, I feel important. <laughs> Okay. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Rafael um, Geddes, and I'm very happy to be here. Yeah, first time in Agadir, not first time in Morocco, but... Um, uh, I usually speak very fast English, so uh, the first thing is, if you are not understanding, then you just raise your hand. Ask me to repeat it. I'll, I'll be fine. It's fine, okay? So the whole purpose is that you learn today. So, I, I mean, I can talk and talk for a while, but I want this to be interactive as possible. So I'll be asking like, do you follow, do you understand, and so on, okay? Um, today, or well, I'll, I'll go through the agenda today. So my background, it's a solar energy engineer, and I was asked by my colleague, uh, Dr. Hisham, um, by Yusrap, to actually deliver a lecture that was on um, the basics of solar energy, but focused on concentrating solar power, which is one of the technologies that we have among all renewable possibilities uh, for, uh, for the future, and it has its advantages compared to other renewables. And my purpose today is that, I don't know, um, I'll ask a question actually. Uh, how many of you are already familiar with concentrating solar power? Okay. And with solar energy? You had PV yesterday, right? So. <laughs> um, okay, so um, the purpose is that after today, I hope that next time you're asked, like, how many of you are familiar with concentrating solar power, then all of you raise your hands. My purpose is that you go through um, the basics of CSP, uh, which is concentrating solar power, uh, the main technologies that we have today, how the market looks like, uh, the main advantage of CSP, uh, and then at the end, I think after 3.30 or so, we are gonna do a small exercise on simulation so that you can, for the future, um, know which software to go for and at least perform a simple uh, uh, like model simulation and so on. So let's start with the first one. So, okay, about myself. Um, so as I said, I'm, um, I'm Rafael Geddes. Uh, I'm a researcher. I, I lead the research group in solar energy and thermal power plants in the uh, KTH, which is the Royal Institute of Technology in Sweden. Um, I have I'm a lecturer there. I have my research group with some PhD students, master students, and uh, I've been, I'm responsible and supervisor for like different subtasks and projects that are at European level. At industry, I'm, I'm only part-time in academia. I'm also in industry, and at industry, I am a co-founder of my own consultancy company, where we offer services for the design and operation of uh, mainly concentrating solar power plants, but we've been working with other PV plants and CSP plants, and thermal power plants in general. Uh, through the company and also in parallel to it, I've been working for all the two companies. One of them, it's a Swedish-based company called Acelio, which is a 
trying to develop a small CSP system or small distributed CSP system. And one that is working at large scale CSP systems called Solar Reserve, which is building tower technology and I show you pictures of our power plant in Nevada. Uh, my background itself, I'm a mechanical engineer. Uh, I'm from Venezuela. Uh, that's where I graduated as a mechanical engineer. Then I specialized in Sweden in renewable energies in a master's level. And then I did my PhD in um, solar financial and technical modeling of solar power plants with storage, and mainly with C focus on CSP. Uh, I've also done some business models, I mean, business co uh, and administration courses in MIT and uh, Grenoble Cold Management um, at ESADI in Spain. So my university, because I was invited here as an academic, it uh, looks like this. Uh, it's, uh, it's a beautiful university. I, will, I hope you can all visit one day. Uh, it was founded in 1827, so it's very old. Uh, we are known for being only technical. I mean, it's, uh, it's only technical universities, so only engineering and, and uh, applied sciences, so mathematics, <laughs> chemistry, physics. Uh, today we have more than 12,000 students. A lot of them are at uh, graduate level, so PhDs and above. Uh, we have 10 main schools, actually that changed. Now we're only eight. And uh, last year we, um, I mean, we usually rank, depending on which school, at different levels. So last year we were ranked, I think like above 30, on top 40, top 30, top 20, is usually where we are moving around in engineering, especially in my department, mechanical engineering. But it all, it, I mean, I live in Sweden, I said, so it actually looks like this. So I'm fooling you, this is something like for last week, probably, like this is summer. Uh, but we usually like this. So that, and uh, that's we never see the sun. I think that's why I work with solar energy, so that at least I can see it online or come to Morocco. Um, as I said, my group is focused, so we have a lab where we, our research is pretty much applied. So meaning that uh, the purpose of my research group is not to derive fundamental new theorems or stuff like this, but more like apply it to industry to see how we can uh, develop new components that can make uh, technologies like CSP more cost effective and rich market. We work with a number of industries. Uh, today, uh, in my group, I have a postdoc, uh, three PhD students, 20 master's thesis students. Um, and I said, this is just some of the companies we work with. Uh, I'll start, so I'll kick off. So this you probably know from yesterday. But the main purpose on this slide is that um, just coming back to the basics of solar energy. So if you look at the targets from the um, International Energy Agency, so which is here at IEA, they said that if we don't do anything, like if we just continue deploying our resources the way we are doing it today, globally, so not necessarily in Morocco. Morocco is doing pretty fine, actually, with the program. <laughs> Uh, we will increase our mean average temperature by six degrees by 2050. There's a lot of consequences with this, I mean, like, that comes together with this. That's why you've heard the whole climate change and stuff that comes with this, basically. Like, if we increase the temp our mean temperature to six degrees, or by six degrees, basically you will see a lot of floods, cities that exist today will no longer exist, and so on. So, do we need to do something about it? We are doing something about it. I mean, like, actually, if I, if I can recommend the book, I uh, will recommend a book called, I have it there, called Factfulness, which is, shows you that we're not doing so bad as, as, as a world, you know? Look, if you look at the media, if you go online, or if you just op open, I don't know, CNN, Fox News, basically, we're just going down. Like, if you, like, you read, you see, like, I don't know if you saw the Avengers, the movie, they are like, overpopulation, we're like, no resources, and so on, that's not entirely true. I mean, like, w as a globe, we're managing. But let's say it's still, this is a challenge, and, this, I mean, there's a problem to it. And if you look at, I mean, one way of not reaching that, but instead, I mean, the IEA set a goal, which is let's uh, change the way we use energy so that we can only increase two degrees, not six degrees by 2050. So that's the 2D scenario. And to do that, then we need to start diversifying the way we use our resources. Today, most of the globe uses fossil fuel resources, and we need to transition. We've started this transition. But if you look at among the resources, then the one that is the most abundant is solar energy. And solar energy actually is the driver for all the resources. Like wind energy actually comes from the way solar impacts the seas, for instance, and so on. So like that, solar energy comes really back. But only looking into irradiation, which is the one that we can harness, and I'll get into that uh, directly, uh, solar energy is so abundant that 
if we do deploy, like, um, um, with the technologies we have today, only fill this area somewhere here in Libya, I should have put it here in Morocco, right? With solar energy technologies, like CSP, PV, and combination of them, we will actually fulfill the demand of the globe. So the energy, I mean, solar energy is abundant. Their problem is how we are using it, right? And the technologies we have today, and uh, luckily we are looking into um, deploying it further. But I wanted to go to the basics, so, uh, and I don't know if you went through this yesterday, so you can say like, no, we know this, Rafael, it's, who cares? But basically, <laughs> uh, I'll go really fast then. So how do we, like, where does the, ener where's the energy comes from the sun? So the energy of the sun, like the, the sun irradiates energy as a, as a body, uh, into space, into the photosphere, which is basically outside of the sun. That's what it, the photosphere is. Now, this radiation, if you look into, if you know, some of you have a back, I guess your backgrounds are more so view engineering or business, like, how many of you are engineers? Okay, uh, how many of you are familiar with uh, heat transfer? Great, so, basically what it means, like, when I talk about, like, how the sun irradiates, the sun is as a body that has a lot of energy, right? and it irradiates energy. And by simple radiation theory, then we can calculate how much energy of the blast, of, of using black body radiation theory, how much energy of the sun impacts the Earth, looking from like just the sizes of the, both the Earth and the sun and distance. So by applying simple body radiation, you can estimate, we know that in a, under, at the atmosphere level, so that's before our, um, well, yeah, before all these clouds you see and so on, so at the atmosphere level, the energy that hits us per meter square is roughly 1.4 megawatt, uh, kilowatt, sorry. So that's one key number. You should remember, like, if you are actually a solar energy engineer, because a solar energy engineer needs to first, that's why I start with these slides, understand where does the energy from the sun come from and how to position the sun at all the times, because that's uh, both for both, PV and CSP. That's the basics. Uh, so if you are on site, and you have an equipment, and it tells you that you're measuring something above this, then you're definitely wrong. You cannot have more than 1.4 kilowatt per square meter, for instance. So that's like a first number you can, you can already know. Now the truth is that if we continue, the Earth is moving around, right, in an elliptical way around the sun. So that number is actually varying. But the variation, it's going from 1.3 kilowatt to 1.4 kilowatts. It's not too much. So if you have to remember a number, 1.3 kilowatt per meter square, it's what we call the solar constant. It's what the, based on basic radiation theory, black body radiation, is what the sun gives us per meter square at the atmosphere level. Now the problem is that at the atmosphere level, we're talking about kilometers from here, right? And we need to use the energy here, not at the atmosphere level, unless we are like living on satellites, which we're not. So. Uh, before I get into the atmospheric effects, then I just want you to know, like, I guess this you know, but the Earth is moving in an elliptical way. That's why um, here in the northern hemisphere, we are now in summer, we are exposed to light more hours of the day, but in winter, the opposite. And then we have the two equinoxes in September and in March, where basically the day is half and half. Okay? You can calculate the, the solar constant, by the way, and these slides are. Uh, public, right? For all of the, you will get all of these slides, right? Rufra or so, uh, you, if you were to do it for any reason, like if you are bored at home on Saturday night, you can calculate like solar constant every day of the year if you want to using this, where n is the day of the year. Um, now, I was saying this, like what I told you before, the solar constant is the one that gets here, like at the atmospheric level. Okay, so it's like 1.3 kilowatt per squ meter square. Now, if I'm here, and these are kilometers distance, I definitely get something less. So what we perceive as a, like, as a human here on Earth is way less than 1.3 kilowatt per square meter. The reason being what we call the atmospheric effects. The main atmospheric effect is obvious, and well, it's here in the picture, but if I asked you, you would say, yeah, we have clouds. So because we have clouds, the light that we see, or the, the energy, gets diffused. And more than that, some gets reflected or just scattered, which means that the particles in our, our air is not fully clean. So the light, just uh, the scattering of the light, we can perceive. So if we were to like uh, do, this is sort of a Sankey diagram. 
which is a diagram that shows losses, basically. Uh, we see that around 50% of the energy gets dispersed. So we can only harness 50 of that, or 50 percent of that, in the, of, the, of that immediate power. We're talking power here um, on the Earth. Because of these effects, even on the most like clear day, what we can really measure is somewhere around one kilowatt. And now I'm talking about the, the clearest days we have. So like, if you go to watch the sat, where where is this like the, the Noor complex, right? On a very good day, we're measuring one kilowatt per meter square. So now you know two things. The solar constant, I mean, if you use black body radiation, based on just theory, pure mathematics, since heat transfer, can provide at atmospheric level 1.3 kilowatt, right? Because we have atmospheric effects, meaning reflection, uh, absorption by the clouds and so on, only part of it reaches the ground on Earth. And even in the best days, where the sky is completely clear, we can measure only one kilowatt per meter square. That's a very good day. Um, now, another thing is that I want to mention is that, of course, if we come back to that we're moving around, and add to that that we're also rotating, the, the path between the sun and your actual position is varying at all times, right? And that increases the atmospheric effects, because it's basically the distance between the sun and you. Uh, in solar energy engineering, we call that uh, the air mass. There's a relation for that. Um, in reality, it's just a measure of path. So it's just the larger the air mass means that the sun is further away from you as, a, as an observer because of its movement. What we do when we design a system is then say, OK, usually for a location uh, with the latitude like Morocco and uh, California, which are pretty much similar, uh, and both with good solar radiation, then our air mass is around, at 1.5, we have usually around 850 watt per meter square. And that we use as a design condition, just so that, so you say, I told you before, we have 1.3 kilowatt per meter square at atmospheric level. Realistically speaking, because of atmospheric losses, at the best days we will reach one kilowatt, so 1,000 watt per square meter. And then if you want to design a system, then usually we design at 850, because it makes no sense to design it for the one and only best conditions, right? But 850 is actually pretty common. And you see, if you start looking at measurements of what's at, you see that every day at noon, so like, and I will get to that. So at noon time, which is where we reach, the sun is above us, right? So at noon time, we will have the best uh, irradiation and irradiance, which would be 850 watt per meter square. Questions so far? All clear? Okay. <laughs> now, that's just basics of concerning like uh, what the potential is. Now, another thing that is important to understand is that how that energy or how that power, uh, if we are on here, if I'm an observer here, I have two sources like that radiation or the, what, what I perceive is the combination of two. The one that is, that I directly see, like here, this arrow, right? And the one that, has, if you look at this, this is very simplistic, some gets reflected, right? In reality, what will happen is that this gets reflected, but there's a cloud here that reflects it back. Or this one that is scattered passes through, but just gets scattered, gets dispersed. So the energy, or the, the, I mean the, the actual power can be, comes from two sources, the beam, which again is what I see directly. If you are on a clear day and you look at the sun and you really need sunglasses because you cannot look very well, that means that you have strong beam radiation on you. But even when it's like, usually in Sweden this example works, like when you're outside, it's still light, you like, you like, it's still clear, even in the cloudiest days, you can still see some light. And that's because we have diffuse energy coming from. So like even in the days like today, today if you go outside, I mean, I don't think, if you just look at the window, we don't have like a strong beam, rather just like some clouds and lights coming through it, right? So uh, if I am on like here on Earth, the global power that I perceive is both a combination from the direct beam and the one coming from everywhere. So that's just the notion I wanted to transmit. Now the other important thing, we will come to this, is 
that uh, in terms of um, irradiance, which is power per meter square, uh, the amount of, I mean, this value, the amount of the, the irradiance itself increases as I actually, the way I position with regards to the beam. So if, if, if I'm in a surface or in a location where I'm actually, if I, if I were a, like a plate, right, and I like this, if I'm facing back the sun, the radiance on me will be zero because um, if I only look at this way, right, I get nothing. But if I just look directly at the sun, then the energy from the beam, it, it's, like, it's greater. But I'll come to this if it's not fully percent clear. <coughs> Meaning that this beam irradiance, what I want to say, is greater than this one. And it should be just um, intuitive because it depends on how the angle of interaction between this surface and the direction of the sun. Question? So now we know 1.3 kilowatt. What's 1.3 kilowatt per meter square? What, what is 1.3 kilowatt per meter square? What is that value? So it's the maximum one at the atmosphere level, right? Uh, in a very good day, what can we really usually measure at noon? One kilowatt. And now the radiation has two components. Beam and diffuse, okay? Good. Now, how we are engineering, uh, how the way we know, of course you can, there are different ways to assess the amount of um, irradiance on Earth. Uh, we do it through combination of satellites, for instance. So satellites can tell us, you know, in a satellite image, yes? Nine for ah, okay, so yeah, I was asked not to ask anything. Okay. <laughs> like you will ask later, okay. I just don't want her to fall asleep, so. Um, we can measure this irradiance, like the diffuse, the, the beam, and the actual power on Earth through equipment. So we have equipment to do that, and of course, if you are gonna start a project, and a project, and we will come to that later after lunch, a solar project is millions of dollars, so, and if we depend on the solar resource, the one thing we need to know for sure is the solar resource. Like how good is our energy? And you know now that it varies every day, it varies every hour, and if you look in a year perspective, it actually varies every year. So like today, this year might be very different from last year and so on. So later when we got the simulation, I'll, I'll discuss, I don't have a slide about it, but like how we build typical meteorological year, which is from a data set of 20 years or so, we build a representative year of that location. But in any case, before starting a project, even if we have this satellite 20-year uh, deri deri um, derivation of data and so on, we need to assess it or validate it somehow with measured data on ground. Uh, to measure the, the radiation, and there are different equipment. One that I show here, uh, it's a pyranometer. So pyranometers, basically, you just leave them there for a while, and they will if you leave them standing alone for, I mean, you, make, you should clean them every now and then because otherwise your data will be not right, but uh, you just need to leave them there on the site and they will start measuring, uh, in this case, the global horizontal radiation. Now the global, and the global is horizontal is because they are just standing there in the, in the horizon, basically. So they just see all the energy coming from both uh, the beam and the diffuse. But I said, so you have the beam, and the diffuse this way, because you know the position of the sun at all times, and I'll come to this angle before or later, uh, you can estimate how much is the beam, and then the rest is just diffuse. So that's one equipment. In reality, we do combine this equipment with another one that I, yeah, because I show some slides, so I mean, I, I give like this lecture in four months, like, so I put like four months thing in my university today. So, <laughs> see some are missing, but basically, I mean, um, we combine this equipment, this pyranometer, with something we call pyroheliometer, which is actually like a longer tube, like this, right? That is, because we know this angle, we can calculate where the sun is at all times. Then that is trying to track it. And then if the light goes on, all to the bottom, we are measuring here, and then that is beam. So that one is the beam, and if we put this next to it, we know the, hor the hor global horizontal, and then we can confirm by doing this that the measurements are correct. It's one way of like uh, doing it. And then if you go towards the sat uh, or 
to any solar plant, you will see that both before project and during project, there are many stations like this. This equipment with a power helimeter. And this is true for both. Everything I've said is true for both CSP, which is today's core, but also PV. I'm just talking about solar energy, right? Now, I've mentioned this before, and this is very important because it's the time. Uh, I said that, okay, we have a notion of 1.3 kilowatt per square meter at atmospheric level. It's the maximum that the sun can provide us. Realistically speaking, at, on Earth, as an observer, the maximum I usually reach is one kilowatt. And then I said that we designed for 850, and then I said that that's usually happen, happening at noon. Because at noon, like with lunchtime, we have the sun, in this case of Morocco, directly south from us, right? Like on top of us and directly south. Now, these notions are in, in very intuitive for me because I work with this every day, but the truth is that that's the basics behind solar energy, knowing how to, depending on the time, where the sun is. And um, one way, one, two key concepts here is that one thing is our time, the one I'm reading now, which we call the clock time. And the clock time is basically noon at the moment when the sun is to south from an observer at the standard meridian. So if we look on Earth, we define that Morocco is given the clock time based on what we call GTM. So the standard meridian that is the same as uh, the Greenwich one in whatever, UK. But in reality, of course, if you look at all the meridians, I mean, I will need to know the, my exact meridian, my exact position, my exact longitude to know where the sun is. The relation between those two is then what we call the solar time, because what we want to know is the solar time, which is telling me noon, not according to whatever someone said it is, but according to where the sun is at the south at 12. So solar time defines, uh, it's just that at solar noon, so at 12, we have the sun directly south from us, if I'm, if I'm in Morocco, or directly north from us if I am in the southern hemisphere, okay? So for every solar calculation, the one we want to use, the one we use is solar time, not solar, not clock time. And this is especially true if you are, for instance, in China. In China, you have um, the same clock time, or the same time zone for the whole country. And as you could imagine, I mean, like, in some parts of the country, like if, you, if you are in Beijing, the sun is rising at uh, crazy times like 4 a.m., but in the other part of the country, like in the west, the sun is rising at 7. Well, it's 4, but in terms of solar time, it's one is 4 and the other is 7, sort of. But in terms of clock time, it's the same, just because they decided to have the same uh, convention. The important thing here is, okay, there's a difference between clock time, the one I have on my watch, and solar time. The one we use as a solar energy engineer is solar time. And the basic way or the simplest way to know what solar time is, is it's just the time at which uh, that, uh, that defines noon, 12, such that at noon the sun is directly south from me, if I'm in Morocco, okay? There are relationships between them. You can go from one to the other using this formula where this is just the standard meridian. So in this case, the GTM for Morocco. This is my actual location, my actual lo uh, longitude. And this is uh, this like a minute error. I didn't put all the factors here, but I mean you can just if you are really interested, you can ask me. And this is that we do what we do like you know the, the solar time in summer, the, the clock time in summer that we're varying plus one minus one. So you can move from one to the other easily with just one equation. Now, the other basic thing. So uh, it's this is what I'm going through now. It's actually helping you define where the sun is. So first is we define this solar time concept, right? And we know that at solar time, at, no at noon, solar noon, the sun is right south from us. So that's the first thing. Now the other thing is that we, we in terms of Earth, sun geometry, how the Earth is moving around the sun and so on. I mentioned this before briefly, but we do have the equinoxes, where at equinox, we see that our declination angle, which is a key angle here, the, uh, the declination is just the angle in relationship between the way the rays of the sun come on Earth and are on, on the axis at which the Earth rotates. So it's this angle. In the equinoxes, so 21st of March, 21st of September, this angle is zero. And that's why in March and in September, like, well, we're soon there, the 21st of September, our days are basically same time, daytime, same time, nighttime. Because we are space, we're exposed to the sun like this. So we are rotating, right? the Earth is rotating, uh, maybe here it's more obvious, but 
So here we are rotating, and here we are rotating, but exactly the half of it, half of the Earth sits like perpendicularly to something. So that's happening two times a year. Now, uh, the other two, I mean, the declination actually goes from 23.5, if I'm in summer, this is uh, for a um, summer, like, uh, like, if I'm in the northern hemisphere, like here, uh, that means that I have more part of it. So that's why, for me, living in Sweden, I live very up north, I have very long days when it's summertime. It's just a matter of like how the declination is with regards to. So like, my Earth is kind of inclined towards the sun. So in Sweden, I have more like longer days. That's basically what it means. The opposite in winter. What is important is that you have a measure of like this angle can be for every location if you know where you are, meaning longitude and latitude. And just the latitude is enough for this one. You can estimate what is your declination angle. Uh, what, um, actually, for any day, you can estimate what the declination angle is because this. This, the Earth's movement is just varying every day, and it. like this angle is varying per day, every day. And by just using this formula, it gives a good approximation. Uh, the other thing is that this angle is varying from its maximum, 23.5, to its minimum, 23.5 minus. So we have the solar time and this angle. Okay, we, we need other angles to define the sun. This angle is basically a function of the solar time. That's why the solar time is important. And this one we call the hour angle. The hour angle is uh, very simple. It just converts the solar time into angles. So that then we can do the math for where the sun is. So if you look at it, I mean, it's, it's a definition. It's just saying, OK, let's put like if solar at, at zero, I mean, at, at noon, sorry, at noon solar time. Remember, from now on, every time I talk about time, it's a solar time. At noon, this angle is zero. That's what it's saying. So before noon, it's negative. After noon, it's positive. And it's kind of like if you were to like model that, and you have the sun somewhere around here, it's basically this angle. Okay. But that angle is not enough. Now what I know it's okay that the sun. I have a notion of like where the sun is with regards to me because all I know is that at this time, it's directly south. So if it's negative or positive, it gives me an indication that it's east or west. But I have no idea of how high is it and how precisely is it from, like, uh, from me in terms of south, right? So for that, we need to define two angles, which is this is the key behind solar energy for any system, knowing the, what is the zenith angle, what is the azimuth angle. So this is for any solar system that you have, being as you have the equipment to calculate the irradiance, so the values I discussed before, 1.3, 1 kilowatt, and so on, and the equipment that calculates, or just I mean, a computer calculating the zenith and the azimuth, because that tells you directly where the sun is. So it's just, as an observer, if this is like north and west east, like the north-south axis and the north-west and the east-west axis, this is called the zenith vector, which is just basically the, uh, de defined as the vector from me up directly up, right? And this is just a standard. So some people will say the azimuth angle is directly the angle if the sun is somewhere in a vector like this, right? It's not directly south, it's not directly west or anything. If the sun has this direction, then this azimuth, I define it as the angle from the south part directly towards the vector of the sun. In some uh, other convention, they will define it from the north to this. But it's just that you need to be clear that it's the one that is basically telling me if I'm here and I know that at noon the sun is somewhere directly south, and so south is like this line, but today, I mean, at this time of the day, the sun is probably somewhere right there, assuming that I'm actually facing south. Then I know that from here to here is my azimuth. That's what I define as azimuth. But in other parts of the world, they would say it's from here to here. But whatever, it's the same. They are complementary, okay? And the zenith, this issue to understand, it's just like, okay, if the sun, again, if the sun is here, and, and this is the vector, like say, the zenith vector is just the one that goes from me up directly up, then it's the angle from, um, if the sun is somewhere like this, so it's from here, to the vector up. That's the zenith. One that is easier to understand that is connected to the zenith is just the elevation, which is how high is the, so the sun. And it's just the, the complementary to 90 of the zenith. So the elevation plus the zenith equals 90. And the elevation is more intuitive because it's how high the sun is. So it's like if I'm here, the sun is somewhere there, it's from here to this, to this angle. So if I know where the sun is in this direction, the azimuth, right? and I know how high it is, then I know where the sun is. And this is what you need to, or what we calculate at all times. 
But to know that, I mean, they are, if you look at the equations, I don't want to go into the detail of the equations, but we can calculate them very easily. We just need to know where we are. So both are a function of, uh, this is the latitude. So latitude is like, for instance, in Morocco, I think now we're in probably latitude 30 degrees, so we can just check it. I mean, we never change our latitude. <laughs> Uh, the declination, which I talked before, it depends only on the day of the year. It could be zero if it's uh, March or September 21st. The hour angle, which is connected to the solar time. So it just tells me the solar time, and then I know the hour angle. And with these angles, then I know directly where the sun is in terms of the elevation. And the same for the, this, where the sun is in terms of like um, the horizon. You say, like, if I know the zenith, which is this one, right? And I know the latitude, and I know the declination, then I know also the azimuth, which is, like, where is it in the horizon? So with this basic angles behind the Earth's sun, I know everything, basically, where the sun is at all times. And that's the basics for solar energy, because we need to know, as I said before, if I want to harness or get more from the sun, then I want my surface me like to face the sun. It's like when you want to get tan. You don't want, you don't, I mean, unless you want to get tan, your back tan, you don't, you don't give your back to the sun, right? You just look at it directly. So now from now on, if you really want to get tan, what you can do is calculate your zenith and azimuth and start moving yourself around. Because there is where you will really follow the beam, right? We do that, I mean, uh, what I just said is basically we want to maximize the energy we want to get per square meter. To do that, then we need to that's why you see that the surfaces, the PV modules, or the CSP collectors are moving, right? So we're getting into the notion of tracking. And then there's another math to it, which is because, okay, one thing is knowing where the sun is, these angles, but then there's another thing is like, how should I position my surface so that I can maximize this? So I don't wanna get into much detail of the, because this looks complex, but it's uh, basically, again, a basic, uh, the basics is, if I know where the sun is, how high it is, and where is it due south, like, uh, so those two angles, the zenith and the azimuth, then intuitively I know how my, my surface should be if I want to get the best out of it, right? Uh, and to do that, I mean, we can calculate then our slope angle, which is like from, if this is a surface that is inclined, how, like, the, the, tr the tilt of the surface, and the same, how should it be in terms of orientation in the horizon? So, and you can, uh, this is what we call then the slope angle or the surface azimuth. But again, the slope angle is trying to follow like, so that you have the right inclination towards the sun, so that this is ideally perpendicular. And then the surface azimuth is because it's not the same if I'm facing, even if I have the right tilt, but the sun is somewhere there, I mean, I need to look at it, right? So, so again, looking, azimuth is always connected to the horizon. What is really important, more than these two angles, that you will, it's just at the end math, how to position them, is that the energy that gets into the collector depends on, or can be assessed in terms of what we call the incidence angle. So one notion that I want you to keep, it's okay, you know now the hour angle, I hope, as the zenith, the azimuth, those are basics where the sun is all the time. But the other important one, when it comes to real engineering, it's the incidence, because it's how incident is my beam in terms of my surface. So it's just basically, if you look at the direction of the sun and the normal of the surface, it's just that angle. If this angle is zero, I'm maximizing the power that I can get from the energy, from the beam, because I'm looking at it directly. So ideally, in every solar system, we will make incidence angle equal to zero. Now you will know, um, by, I mean, all of you that are engineers at least, like, that we cannot really physically do this at all times. I mean, we have structures. We, have, we cannot at all times make this angle equal to zero. So that's why we need to calculate it based on the structure that we have, the way we are tracking the sun. Um, and this incidence effect is the main loss in every solar energy technology, PV, CSP. And that we call it the cosine effectiveness. So how good can we track the beam? If I was like a, like a single panel, uh, able to move in both axes, like in both the azimuth and the elevation, that angle will be zero all times. My cosine effectiveness will be one, meaning that the total on my surface is equal to the total beam because I'm directly tracking all the time. 
if you look at the systems, you'll know that this is not true. We have like, if you look at PV systems, for instance, it's like, it's cheaper to have a rack of PV models together following in one direction, which means then that if the sun is moving and you're only tracking in one direction, this is varying at all times, the incidence, right? And then this is varying at all times, so you have losses. So only maybe at the design point, this is one. But then at all times of the year, then you will have a loss here. That's the main source of loss for every solar uh, this, uh, energy um, technology, CSP and PV. Uh, I barely mentioned this, but this is intuitive. You can, like I said, have a dual axis tracking, which then this is one because basically you are at all times following the sun because you, have free, uh, you are free in both degrees, so like the azimuth and the elevation. But you could imagine this should be intuitive if you are if you have a PV module that is doing this at all times, that means that per module you need actuators, you need a controller that is at all the time doing this. And this is not cheap. That's the main reason why we don't have that for a system. If you look into CSP, this gets even more complex. You will see why today, at least I hope, we cannot do this on the technologies we have today because we are reflecting and we will get to that. I mean, you're not just aiming towards the sun and giving it back to the sun. You need to reflect the energy somewhere else which means that in CSP, this loss is the largest, for sure, the cosine loss. And that happens, of course, in single axis tracking. I mean, if you have only, like in the parabolic trough plants you have in NUR, this or any PV rack, like I said before, if the sun, if I am the rack like this, right, and the sun is moving like this, then, of course, this cosine is firing depending on the function of this angle at all times, and maybe at some point of the day it will be one at noon, hopefully, if you're facing, if you put this rack towards south and so on. But the other times at noon, one minute, like 12 1, you already have a loss. Okay? So that's the main thing there. Um, and that brings me back to, I think this is before, ah, okay, before. So I wanted you to know this. This is everything I've said applies to both. Because this is basically what's behind solar energy engineering. Knowing how much power I can get which we discuss, knowing why is it lower on Earth, atmospheric effects, the movement of the sun, the way I track with regards to the sun. And then if I know that and I know how to estimate where the sun is and the amount of energy, because I show you how to get uh, equipment to, to measure it, then I can think of which technologies can I use to harness solar energy. So everything I've said is just the basics, it's just like the potential of solar energy as we get it on Earth, but now to convert that solar energy into something useful for us, whether heat or electricity, we have technologies to do that. So on the right here, we have CSP, which is the one I'm going to talk about today. This is some, you will see today also that this is my favorite technology, which is power. And on the left here, we have PV, which I was not asked to talk about, so you, you already went through it yesterday, I think. So they are completely different. I mean, like PV is based, it's mainly purely material based because as I hope you went through that yesterday, it's based on the, on the PN junction effect. So it's basically uh, a silicon based media material gets excited and, and then it's able to create current. That's the whole thing. So it's very simplistic, but then as a conversion process, but when it comes to deliver or building this equipment, the media, it's the material itself, it's the main challenging thing. So, all everyone in PV that is interested in PV, I say like there are two things like you can be like me. I, I like PV a lot, but I'm more like only on the system level, how to put them, how much energy we can get from them based on existing technologies. But most of the research in PV is not on doing that because that's just the engineering part of it. It's really on which how to change these materials so that we can be more effective, how to increase the efficiency of the cell, and so on. And that's that why if you look into if you're interested in our research path, most of the research here. It's purely material science. This one is more connected to my background because this is a lot of mechanical engineering. Here we have um, movements of equipment. We have reflection um, in optical engineering. We have a lot of thermal energy because this is a completely thermal process. And we'll get to that. Basically, you are converting the solar energy into heat. And the heat can be used then either directly if you want just hot stuff or to process it from heat to electricity to a power conversion unit, like, uh, like the coal plant in Joflas Far. 
I hope I said it correctly. But basically, it's like, so you just say, like, we have steam, which is hot water. Um, through using any typical power cycle, we can put into electricity. So the, the difference here is we go directly, one main difference, there are many more. Here we go directly from solar energy to electricity by the PN junction effect. Here we go from solar energy to high temperature heat, and then, if we want to, to electricity. Now, there is a main advantage of CSP compared to PV, at least today. It comes to the fact that we have this intermediate step. So, as a process, it's more troublesome than PV, because as I said, PV is basically, it gets excited with the light, and then uh, the electron would move to the proton, put together and create a current. And if connected to a load, electricity. Here we have a number of processes happening. So as an engineer, it's interesting for me, but as uh, someone that is more like into financing this would be like, oh, this is too complex. I would rather finance this other small one, right? When we get to this, there's a key thing on why we still do this, which is that this intermediate process of heat, I mean, the fact that we convert the energy into heat, allows us to integrate thermal energy storage. And thermal energy storage, unlike batteries, which I don't know if you went through yesterday, is cheap. So the whole thing of having CSP is because we can store energy, cheap with the technologies we have today, and it will probably get cheaper and cheaper as we continue doing research. So the more, I mean, this sounds, some years ago, as I was in the industry, people would say like, no, the CSP industry is dead because PV is so cheap and so on. Ironically, what happened is that the more PV, the more the system realized that, well, but now we have a lot of energy, a lot of energy at times in which we don't need it. So we have our other complementary solar technology which at the prices today can give us solar energy when we need it. So in terms of deploy capacity, we have today in the world something like 300 gigawatt PV and only five CSP or six CSP. But I mean, that's the thing. One is actually leading to the other one. So unlike some years before where people were saying we're dead, we as a CSP industry, because of more PV, we're actually seeing that there's more interest in CSP. At least until batteries come to a lower, lower, really low cost, which is not the case today, and I don't want to get into that discussion, but even if the batteries get to lower cost, the scales of storage we're talking about here are completely different than the scales of a battery system. Um, but okay, go back to processes only. So in CSP we have, this is the basis. Solar energy is converted into high temperature heat, and the high temperature heat into electricity. Because we have this intermediate high temperature heat, we can add thermal energy storage, and actually without it, it makes no sense to have this system. And on top of that, we can also hybridize, meaning that you could actually use another type of fossil fuel or even another uh, resource to create heat and hybridize it with solar CSP. So that you can have your end product, which is electricity. In a tower technology, and this you will see in all the technologies, but I just to, to, to make a representation a schematic, what is happening then is like, we have a collector field. In the case of the tower, they're called heliostats. So these are structures made of mirror glass that are basically tracking the sun, which is in the math that I had shown before, so that they can redirect the lights here, right? And here we have uh, what we call the receiver because it's receiving all the light. That's just what the name is that. But the receiver is nothing but a heat exchanger. So basically, we're getting all this radiation and if we pass a fluid through it, so we are going from a cold fluid that is pumped up and it's cold, but because it's getting all the radiation, it gets hot, so we put it hot in this tank. Now, after we've done this process, which is we can do every day, basically, as long as we have sun, we discharge charging, discharge, like discharging the tank, filling in, we can fill our tank. On a separate parallel thing, not connected to the sun availability, we can deploy the energy in this tank, meaning like let use a pump to get the fluid from this tank, to then create steam, like in a normal heat exchanger, so from this fluid to water, because this fluid is hot, it will create steam, so the water will convert to steam, and the steam will drive a steam turbine that is connected to the grid. So this is the, the principles behind CSP. Um, and we will get to that throughout today. Uh, in reality, a plan looks so, this, I mean, is key because here, this system, like the power block, at this stage, is completely decoupled from whether we have sun or not. 
I mean, I literally produce energy. As long as I have a fluid in my hot tank, I can produce energy whenever I want to. So basically, uh, if you look at to these tower systems, for instance, right below the tower where the power block is, it will just look like any other power plant, because it, this is just like any other power plant. It's just that instead of having the, the burner, the gas burner, we have like the typical like industry three pipes with the red thing that are like just throwing a lot of like gas to the atmosphere, then we are reaching the heat by using the sun. And instead of you seeing this tree, like the typical industry thing, like with the whole smog, what you see then is now like something like this, which is like a very light, for me, beautiful uh, reflection of light around this um, heat exchanger. Uh, in reality, I just described one of them, which is this one, um, which you will see it's probably the one I'll talk the most, but uh, this basically, the whole, in this terms of solar energy to heat, it's the same principle. We use some sort of glass mirror collectors to, re to redirect the light from where the sun is to a specific line or a point. Now, here we have the one I talked before. We use this called heliostats structures to direct it to the receiver. And here we have the fluid and so on. Here it's hot. But we can do the same with a parabolic dish, which is a technology where this is the only one that is tracking the sun at all times, because this is a parabola that at the, set, at the focus spot has an engine. So basically, in terms of optical efficiency, this is the best because, as I said before, this has zero cosine losses. And then we have the line collectors, which is basically, col uh, instead of focusing into one point, they're only tracking in one direction, so they can only track towards a specific line. And we get more into that. Well, wait, it's hot for me. I'll just, I forgot I'm in Morocco. <laughs> Okay. Um, so, but I'll talk about a, a bit about each of these technologies, so you have an, an understanding. Although we then will focus on this and this today only, because they are the most mature in the tower and the parabolic trough. But basically, we have the point focus technologies, which are these two in the center, um, and we have uh, the line focus, which are the linear Fresnel and the parabolic trough systems. So that's what I said in this line. Um, as again. These ones, in terms of tracking, they are different because here we have these mirrors are tracking the sun in both the azimuth and the zenith direction, right? But they ha their cosine effectiveness is not one, even though they are tracking in both directions, because they need to reflect to a fixed point. So there's always an angle between the normal of my surface and the point where I want to reflect. I mean, the, the, where the, the point the, where the sun is. So of course I'm reflecting to the normal of my surface, but the, there is always that angle, sort of. So in this one, the cosine effect is zero. I mean, I'm doing two axis tracking, and I'm literally reflecting towards the focal spot of my parabola. So here the cosine effectiveness is uh, one, so no losses for cosine. This one, it's uh, no, not so much deployed, although there are some um, systems here in Ben I think where you have a uh, uh, Fresnel system. The Fresnel system, back in the days where this was too costly, they were seen as an opportunity because they are not tracking, which means that, um, of course, you have a lot of losses, but you also avoid the cost of having all the equipment to track. So these are very simple mirrors, like the ones, not exactly like the ones you have in your bathroom, but very similar in structure, so they are cheap and they're fixed. It's just that they, together, are in some angle that kind of resemble these parabolas. So everything here is sort of fixed in the system, which makes it cheap. But then, of course, you have a lot of optical losses. So in terms of what you can reach here, in terms of temperatures and so on, it's way less. And then we have this is the most mature technology, the most commercially available. Uh, I'll get to those numbers also today, which is like these mirrors that are kind of parabola shape, like cylinders, that in the, at, the axis, at the axis of the cylinder sort of, you have the a fluid passing through, and of course it gets hot. I mean, it enters cold here, but it leaves hot as it gets all the light on it. Um, one notion before we go to the, I don't know if I'm good with time. I think I am, yeah. Before we just have the break, 
It's that we can differentiate all these technologies in terms of how efficient they can be from an optical collector field point of view only. And that notion, we do it with something we call the concentration ratio. So all the different CSP technologies can reach a different theoretical concentration ratio. And by now, it should be intuitive from what I described before, because just looking at the cosine losses, they will have different ways of con how much. The concentration ratio is just a measure of where we used to say how much suns are in one point. So like, if you look at the, um, and the easiest way to, cut to estimate it, it's a total mirror area um, divided by the mirror, by the area of the point or the whatever I am aiming to. So the greater the mirror area to the mirror or to the receiving area, that means that I'm concentrating a lot. So I mean, and that depends on which, depending on which technology you're using, then allows you to estimate more or less what you can reach in terms of temperature, uh, in terms of, uh, because of a trade-off of efficiency. In reality, it's not obvious that, of course, from a collector point of view, we want to reach higher temperatures. Um, you would think intuitively, because the higher the temperature, from a system point of view, sorry, has a better, that means that your optical efficiency is higher, you're, you're collecting as much as you can there. And also, the higher the temperature, if you, for those that are engineers, know Carnot efficiency, the higher the temperature, the better the delta T that I can use in the power cycle. So the more efficient my power cycle could be. However, what's the problem with the higher the temperature? Can anyone just, why is not so good to have, I mean, I can continue, I mean, as a tower, I could actually continue concentrating and increasing the temperature on the part of the receiver. But I know from a system perspective, combining the optical efficiency or the total system optical plus receiver and looking at the receiver efficiency, there is a problem. So degradation, uh, not exactly, because that could happen at every temperature. True, yep. Sorry? Um, that's true, but I mean, in reality, I mean, one of the reasons why we don't go high in temperature is because we don't have the materials to go high. So that's true, but let's say we do. Just theoretically, if, if we look at the notions again of radiation, the higher the temperature on the receiver, the higher the radiation losses, because radiation losses go with the power, I mean, the temperature to the power of four. So that means that from a system perspective, if you're looking at, okay, we said we have this, which can be very good optically, put a lot of energy here, but the more we put energy here, the higher the temperature here, the less efficient this is, because then this will irradiate the more. So there's a trade-off. That's why, depending on which system you're talking about, a linear Fresnel system has a very low concentration ratio, and from an optimal point of view, can reach only up to 300 degrees or something like this before the radiation losses just affect the system. From a parabolic trough, it's a lower concentration ratio. Optimal systems are around 100 concentration ratio, which means that they can reach, ideally, up to 400, even 500, or 600 degrees Celsius without losing too much from an efficiency from a mechanical, thermal engineering point of view. Towers, the same, and, and this, the dishes, which can be 3,000, 4,000 concentration ratio, are very efficient. So like from a system point of view, you can compare all of them. Now, I haven't talked at all about cost. That's another story. Like, this is like, I mean, of course, when you put cost into the equation, you realize that that's why we have more of this, because this is what's cheaper, even though these are other two are more efficient or so. And this I mentioned, depending on the temperature you reach, of course, you can talk about, so if you have a different concentration ratio, which now you know is kind of sort of linked to the temperature, uh, you can have different power units. So if you're reaching a temperature that is 600 degrees, of course, then there are power conversion blocks that are more suitable for that, like a steam cycle. If you are talking about um, temperatures that are between 600 to 800 or 900 degrees, maybe still an engine is more suitable. If you're talking about temperatures that are above 1,000 degrees, then a gas turbine is more suitable. So like all of these are coming to play when you're doing um, the engineering behind CSP. And we will get into that later. So I think now it's the time for questions. And I have a system, I think.
Okay. So you see the questions too. I'll uh, try to answer all of them before we kick off, which is in 15, right? Okay. I, I guess it's fine. So the name of the book you said earlier. Ah, well, this is not connected to solar energy, by the way. This is just if you're um, on your leisure time. Uh, I think it's useful. It talks about facts. So the name, the book is called Factfulness, and the reason why I recommend it is just because I was reading it on my way here, which is actually very troublesome to come here. <laughs> but uh, so um, if you have time, I mean, it's an interesting book. It talks about the, um, it's Factfulness by Hans Rosling, which is Swedish. Maybe that's why I also read it. But uh, the truth is this book talks about we're not doing so bad as, as a world, basically. So if you can look at it like, you know, if I, uh, they ask the same questions to all the politicians, you know, what's poverty in, in this place and so on, and everyone gets it wrong. I mean, we're not doing so bad. Like, poverty is decreasing and so on. But intuitively, if you ask everyone in the developed world, we think we're going to hell. Uh, so, but it's not true. That's the whole point with the, with the, with the, with the book. For calculate direct and diffuse radiation, we use pyranometer and pyrohelimeter. Can you explain to us the principle of function of that two tools? So I went through it, but basically one is um, one is just on the ground, right? Like the one I showed before, the pyranometer. The pyranometer. It's a it's a small camera device. I mean, um, it's a camera that it has a it's reading it's reading uh, like power per meter square at all times, but it's not moving. It's just flat there means that it's actually calculating the global horizontal, which is the energy, both the diffuse and the beam that that point gets, because that thing is not moving. So that's just like uh, this system that looks like a spaceship. Now, the other one, the parahelimeter, I didn't bring a picture, but it's basically, as I said, it's a tube that, because we can calculate the zenith and the azimuth, it's trying to follow the sun, right? And if it's right, then what happens is that the beam should go directly from the entry of the tube, which is the glass, to the bottom where there is a, a measurement unit. Because that should be beam directly if it's connected, if calculating the, the position right. And then that is directly the beam. So what you try, what you do on the side is that you have both the beam measurement, the global horizontal measurement to confirm, and then you can derive what is the, and because you also know the angles. So you can derive what is the diffuse, what is the beam, and, and more or less like check. Can you please tell us the amount of radiation we lose because of clouds? I mean, the ratio between beam radiation and diffuse radiation. So, uh, well, I don't know if I can bring my picture, but again, at atmospheric level, um, on best, I mean, like, uh, theoretically, we can reach like 1.2 kilowatts, right? Now, the amount that gets on the ground is varying at all times. I mean, as you saw before, it's really like, uh, depending on where the sun is, depending on the amount of, uh, like, turbidity or cloud cloudiness and so on, we will have less and less beam. Um, now, in the best days, when the, when we have like clear sky, sort of, which means like almost no clouds, at the ground level, even when no cloud, we lose sort of 25% of that, meaning that from 1.3 we go to one kilowatt, right? The reason is because even in the best days when we have no clouds, there is a lot of, I mean, you don't see it, but there is a lot of particles in the air that scatter the light. And some even absorb the light. So like, and, so, and the earth also reflects light. So it means like only part of it is really light. I hope that answered the question. I mean, reality though is that this is just even in the, in, the, in the best moments of the day. But of course, as we are later in the afternoon, where our path, like you said before, the air mass concept is longer, the more the uh, light has to travel from the sun to me, the more it is exposed to particles, to clouds, to everything, the less I get. How to use the pyrometer? Well, you need to basically install it and leave it there for a while and read from home all the measurements. And thank, I mean, and hopefully no bird will stand on it, which happens a lot. And hopefully it will not, um, well, do number two on it because then it's really like it damages all the data for a, for a number of days. But basically, you just leave them alone for a while so that you can collect data. Can you give us an example for the equation mentioned in slide 15? Let's see. Ah, okay. So, well, the simplest example would be to know what it is now. So today my clock says, right now my clock says it's like uh, seven past 10. 
if I use this equation, if I know where my standard, and this is GPM here, so here we go what I'm reading, right? Uh, 10.07, <coughs> this is what we go here. So now if I know this, uh, which I'm not 100% sure from the law code, but let's say zero is because we are GPM, and this will be probably 15 because we are uh, um, moving from, we are slightly, I'm not sure actually if we are slightly west or east, but it will be minus approximately here. Uh, whatever, I mean, I don't know where is my location, but that's okay. If you know this, zero minus your longitude, divided by 50 degrees, uh, I didn't put the coefficients for this, but it's usually this will add one minute or less, so it's not like a minute. If you know this only, then I can convert to the constant flow time. And what I know, uh, I don't know if we have um, the, the, the daylight savings time here in Morocco, I think we don't, right? We do? So probably my solar time is somewhere uh, like, slightly less, like half an hour behind my clock time. Something like this. So, but I mean, that's the whole point with this equation, that if you know where you are, you can move from 10.07 to 10.37, which is my solar time, which is the one that I'm gonna use for calculations. Uh, okay. Can you please explain Zenith as an on the angle related to the sun position in the sky? So, uh, so this is key. If I know the solar time, I know the hour angle, because the hour angle is just basically converting solar time into angle, right? Now, if I know the hour angle, and I know the latitude, which means where I, wherever I am, I mean, that's fixed, right? Then, and I know the time, the day of the year, uh, if I know the day of the year, I know the declination. So if I know the hour angle, the latitude, and the declination angle, I can know, I can calculate just by a formula the zenith or the elevation. The elevation I think is easier to understand. And the, the, the notion of elevation is just how high the sun is. So at each precise time, if I know the clock time, I can know the solar time. If I know the solar time, I know the hour angle. If I know the hour angle, and I know which day of the year is it, I know the declination angle. If I know the declination, the hour angle, and my position, which is the latitude, I know the zenith. And the zenith is basically how high, I mean, they complement her to how high the, the, the sun is. What I don't know then is like, okay, I know this is high, but I could be that there or here or here or here, or here right? So then I know another angle, and that is what I define the angle from the south to that point of the sun as the azimuth. And it's just on the horizon. So, so that I know if I know it's this high, where? In which direction, right? And the azimuth is just then a function of the zenith, which you know now, and you add to it again latitude and um, hour angle. So if you know these three angles, like the hour angle, the latitude, and the declination, uh, you know everything where the sun is. You should be able to calculate where the sun is. I see that you started explaining the angles after I sent the question. Thank you. Ah. Um, I got confused. What's the difference between zenith and elevation? They are just complement, I mean, they, are, they complement each other, which means that, complementary, sorry, which means that zenith plus elevation equals 90. I just refer to elevation because it's more intuitive. Elevation is from zero to where the sun is. Zenith is from the zenith vector, which not everyone knows, to where the sun is. So it's like the other one, but it's, it's the same. So if you know one, you know the other. A teacher has told us, if you don't use tracking system, the inclination of the PV plan should be latitude minus 20 degree at summer. And I mean, this is just a rule of thumb. The, the truth is, Depending on where you are, and this is part of the optimization system, I mean, of optimizing a system. Depending on where you are, if you don't have the resources to have a tracking system, then you need to incline your PV. Or, well, or you decide to put it flat. I mean, it's up to you. And of course, if you are on the equator, what would you do? You put it flat. I mean, you leave it there because the sun will be like moving all the time like this. So in the best scenario, you minimize the losses on one of the axis. So you just have that. So then whatever he told you doesn't apply. But if you are in a region like in the tropics, like here, like the tropical um, region, th it is true that there's a rule of thumb that you should incline it, or that the losses, when you look at the annual perspective, the losses from cosine decrease if you just incline it with the latitude. So if we are at 25 degrees, then let's say you put your surface facing south because you know the, the, the sun is always gonna be south to you if you are in this hemisphere. But then if you cannot put it like tracking anywhere, you put an angle to the surface that is equal to your latitude. So here will be 20 something. But this, in, in reality, it's a 
it's, a, it's an optimization problem. I mean, like, in, I mean, and even even when you don't have a tracking system as an engineer, what you could do is that then you go if it's your own one, right? And you have it in your roof, and you are familiar, and you don't mind like playing with like, like, I mean, I like playing with it. So like, if you don't mind like playing with the electricity there, you can directly tilt it at, at four times a year, so that you at least you could, you know, like in the summer you put it like a bit higher. Uh, sorry, a bit like more like flat. In the winter, you put it a bit higher because the sun's gonna be like further away, uh, and you can do this if you don't have a tracking system. Like you know, four times a year you go and change it, so to say. Mm -hmm. Does the tracking algorithm try to minimize the incidence angle all the time? Yeah, that's the whole purpose. So that if you if you were able to make the incidence angle zero, the cosine effectiveness is one, so you have no losses. From mean, I mean that means literally that you are harvesting in the best way the beam radiation. Is the dual tracking of a solar collector considered as a multi-objective optimization problem? Well, it's a different thing here. Um, multi-objective optimization is just um, using applying math to any engineering system or any to any like financial systems usually. Something. And we will get to that how I use multi-objective optimization. But whether I mean you can get from from optimizing you can get whether it makes sense or not to have a dual tracking system. If you, if you put there as part of the optimization <coughs> to consider dual tracking and you add cost to dual tracking, then the, maybe the optimizer tells you it makes no sense to do dual tracking. I mean, it might be more efficient, but then it's this way costly. So from a um, cost effectiveness point of view, it makes no sense. Uh, and that could come from an optimization. But I mean, ha on its own, it's not a problem. I mean, you could, if you have the money, you go for dual tracking. If you for you and you can have it in your system, your house. So. I mean, at the end, what you wanted to know is notions of what you can do with dual tracking, what you can do with single axis tracking, and why do we track? Um, what material is the tower's receiver made of? Okay, so that depends. Um, we will. I don't know if we'll get into much detail into that, but the the fluid that is passing through the receiver could be, and uh, there, there are many options depending on the power cycle we're talking about. In the one that I was showing before, the fluid that is passing through it, is a co it's, a, it's a salt. But it's not like a salt like the one we use for, for the kitchen. But in reality, it looks kind of like water, but it's more viscous. Uh, and it's a salt that has the properties that it, it's still liquid at five, 565 degrees, at 585 degrees, with a very good heat capacity. So that it's ideal to keep it stored. That's why we use this salt. We call it the solar salt. Now, then, since we are passing a salt, salts are corrosive. That's, that's, that's the one thing. If you, those of you that are in material engineering, chemical engineering, salts are corrosive to metals. So the, the, the receiver is a combination of a metallic structure that is coated or jacked, meaning that it's protected, right? With another media that avoids the corrosion or that stops corrosion. And also it's uh, like covered in another material or coated in ab absorber coating that is enhances radiation because on the outside you want to get as much as you can from the sun and avoid radiation losses so then you coat it so for instance like if you have a if I go to the sun today if I were to paint that's why if you see the receivers they're all black it's not because the material is black it's because if I go out now today you know white reflects light so if I go now today I'll feel pressure outside that if I was wearing a black t-shirt so that's why you see that all the receivers are like black coated, but it's just not black paint. It's also a material that actually enhances uh, air radiation. Hope that answered the question more or less. In reality, it's like uh, much more complex than that. <laughs> I find C-speed technology much more competitive to PV since PV needs batteries, which are much more expensive than tests. What do you think? I agree. I work with that, right? <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I, in reality, I like to say I work with both. Uh, but I think each one has a role. So if we're talking about, I mean, could you put like a CSP with a tower on top of your house? No. Do you need for your house really uh, 13 hours storage? Most likely not. Like most likely you have a battery that is in terms of size equivalent to four or five hours. And depending on the, um, uh, the system, the, the rated power of the system, that will fulfill your demand. So depending on like the purpose of the of the of what the energy, the shape of the energy means. Maybe I, as a user in my house, I need 
at rush hour at 6 p.m. when I come back and I turn all the lights because I'm like that and then the, the music and the TV and, every, and the kitchen and everything, at the top peak, and maybe I have like, I don't know, let's say one kilowatt. It's not true, I live alone, so. <laughs> but like uh, one kilowatt then, but maybe at, I mean at noon I'm working here, I'm in Morocco, so hopefully nothing's on in my house now. So in reality, all I need is like very few moments where I will need to store the en this energy for, or so like something like this. And then I'm talking about a kilowatt or even watts. So a CFP system is not for me at all. He's talking about, uh, for me, it would be more suitable to have a PV with battery, even if more costly on a dollar per megawatt hour. But if I'm talking about like the government of Morocco did, which is like, we want a lot of energy to be stored from the sun so that we can supply the grid for the people as the sun sets. If we're talking about massive amounts of energy storage, then we have hydropower, where maybe if we don't have the rivers enough, or if the rivers are already depleted, <coughs> then we have solar energy. If we have solar energy, then we have PV. So mainly those two are the ones renewable dispatchable technologies at grid level that we can provide our system with. And there we don't, we don't compete with PV batteries. So it's really depending on like where, what, what, what this purpose is. So for me, it's not competition, it's they are complementary and they have a different role. That's my mastership. And you shouldn't, I don't want you to live this much as like, like no, CSP is better than PV, or PV is better than CSP, because literally they, they have a different purpose. Um, can Helios stats from central receiver be equipped with tracking systems so it can reflect much more solar radiation? We'll come to that, but of course they are tracking, because if they weren't tracking, then they basically, the light would go anywhere. But you want it only into the receiver points. But that's the whole next lecture, or yeah. I'm taking more time, but I guess it's good that I answered the questions. I don't know what the organizer, but I, I'll answer the questions. Um, why is parabolic dish less used even if losses are low? What do you think? Yeah, so as an engineer, I mean like one thing is technology and the other thing is cost. And I mean, truth is, I mean, we go for cost. I mean, we, we like, of course, most of the systems we use are not the best. It's just the best from a cost-effective point of view. I'd rather have a, 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 a cell phone with um, this one of these like new technology for batteries, which actually lasts forever and so on. But we don't have them anywhere. No one can buy them. Instead, we use these li lithium-ion batteries that are like that get our phones like hot and discharge after 10 hours if you are using WhatsApp and so on, because that's what's cost-effective today. But it's the same, the same here. I mean, that's one reason. But the other main reason, actually, apart from cost, for parabolic dish not to be used, is that today, for the level of temperatures that the parabolic dishes concentrate, and the two axis tracking movement and so on that they have, we don't have a suitable storage technology. So there is no storage technology that we can couple to the parabolic dish. And then this comes back to our first notion. If we have a CSP technology without storage, that means that it's directly competing with uh, PV, right? And PV is, at least I mean today, comparing a system CSP without storage with PV, PV is like four times cheaper, five times cheaper. If, if the CSP system has no storage, then it makes no sense, right? Uh, and this is the problem with parabolic dish, that we don't have a technology that we can just put to store energy. We done? Okay, um, I'll come I think I will answer most of these questions anyway as I go through, so we'll see. Uh, but after all, I mean, otherwise, I mean, I'll be here until five, I think, so you can always approach me. Let's see. Now, for the next 45 minutes, or half an hour apparently, what I'm going to talk about is more in detail about uh, uh, the main two technologies of CSP, so it's parabolic trough and tower, which are also the ones that we have in Morocco. Because, you know, in Noor, what's the sad, we have a complex, um, first a 150 megawatt complex, and now a second 200 megawatt complex that are parabolic trough, and now a 150 megawatt tower system that are going to be commissioned in October. Um, and also because they are the ones that dominate the market. 
So if you, if you are to know two technologies about CSP, then it's like parabolic trough and tower. And then I'm, after I talk a bit more about the, the technologies itself, which are some of the questions there, I'll go into what the market looks for CSP, what the costs are for CSP, where is CSP being deployed. So whatever I've shown before in uh, schematics looks like this in real life. So this is a tower system that I really love because I worked in that project. This is the Crescent Dunes project in Nevada, uh, developed uh, by the company I work for called Solar Reserve. This is a system that I also really like because I work in this company. It's called Cleanergy as well. Well, now it's called Acelio. But back then, so this is the tower. What is interesting here, by the way, um, is that you see how small the tower looks like? I mean, this tower is actually in reality, that one in Nevada, it's um, from the bottom to the center point of the receiver, it's about 220 meters. So this is a skyscraper. I mean, this is a building. But here you see it really low, like really small. So it gives you an idea of how, how, how large these fields are. And in this field in particular, here we talk, we have from here to the furthermost, which I think, I don't think it's in this direction actually, it's like somewhere here. It's, uh, we have around 1.6 kilometers. Okay, so we're talking about huge systems. I mean, in, on a diameter, we're talking three kilometers. Um, and this is just 100, this is 110 megawatt with uh, 10 hours of storage. Um, here we have the dish technology, which as I said, I mean, they are look like your an, like parabolic antennas for TV, basically. And they are tracking the sun at all times in the two axes so that they can reflect it to a center point where there is an engine in this case, and then they produce electricity. The problem with the systems is that, as I said before, they, we don't have a cost-effective storage for this. So that's why they're not deployed. We have the parabolic troughs, and I like this picture because even though this is like a test facility, it gives you an idea of how, how large these collectors are compared to people. I mean, there's someone here that's actually taller than me, and then you have like, this is the real collector. So it's like a massive structure, metallic structure, with mirrors that are concentrating the light the, into this um, pipe. And then what happens is that here, the fluid enters cold. After being exposed to all the light, at the end of the light, at the end of the pipe, it's hot. And this is the one I told you before that is the cheapest. Uh, at the early stage of CSP, it was believed to be like more useful because it was cheaper by far than the other ones. Now the other ones are decreasing cost, so, and this is very non-efficient, so that's why we don't have them today except in India, where they are using it and so on for some projects. But basically, all these are mirrors that are like very similar to the ones you have in your bathroom. They are flat, I mean, they're just like lines of mirrors, but together, the way they are inclined, form or try to form this shape, so that then, at some points of the, most points of the day, they can reflect here. But since they are not tracking, you could imagine what is the efficiency of this. I mean, at some points of the day, they will reflect here, but suddenly some of the reflection gets here, and it's the same concept. I mean, the fluid enters hot, cold, it's supposed to leave hot, but of course, what you can really reach is lower, I mean, in terms of temperatures and power that you can get. So this gives you an idea of what we're talking about, and I will go now into one technology, uh, this image is not good, but well, it gives you an idea still. Uh, we'll start with parabolic troughs. Um, I, I will start with parabolic troughs because parabolic trough technology is the one that is most deployed in CSP. So CSP has a operating capacity, plants online, roughly about six gigawatt. And about, I mean, I'm from those six gigawatt, close to 75% of the plants look like this. Exactly like this, actually. Like, uh, same configuration, just copy paste it all the time. Um, which is like, uh, this is a parabolic trough plant, which again, this is a very large field. Um, and in the center of the field, or whatever in the field, you will see a power block unit where you have the steam generators, the storage tanks. This plant is uh, very interesting because it's very large, 280 megawatts, so that's why it requires a lot of tanks. In, in terms of energy, it has six hours depth or six times that as energy store e electrically. Uh, this plant is in Arizona. Uh, the plant uses a steam cycle, and the fluid that is passing through all the pipes here, it's called, uh, it's, an, it's an oil called thermonol. Um, this plant is also very iconic because 
this one's one of the first. So CSP revolution sort of like dates back to 1980s, where in California they were testing the systems like a tower, a trough, in what they call the, the loose projects, or just solar electric gen electricity generation systems, the loose projects. And they had like small, well, small, still megawatt scale facilities testing all these concepts, all these technologies, all the collectors. The real first commercial project that was at a megawatt, like a 50 megawatt scale with a contract for selling electricity was the Andasol One plant, which is in Spain, um, it's close to Seville or in Granada. And after that one, and after the success of that one, then they built two more next to it. So today there are like three blocks like this, all of them of 50 megawatt. So that's why it's very iconic. It proved that we could have CSP at a commercial level and it could be efficient and that you can store energy from parabolic trough. Mm, now, I like this one because I just wanted to bring you back to the notion that CSP is not only about generating electricity. Actually, CSP, we convert the solar radiation into heat. And heat could be the end product. I mean, like, if we want just hot, like hot stuff, that's, that's it. We don't need to put a, a power conversion unit. I mean, and that's still CSP. And here is an example. Uh, this is in Oman, where in an, I like this just because it shows you how, like, we are transitioning from solar energy to oil, oil, first oil to solar energy and vice versa. Here is basically, in, uh, in a, um, just to put it simple, in a very mature oil field, um, the, the oil, it's, co it's called like um, heavy crude oil, which is basically very viscous oil that is hard to extract. What we do, like meaning engineering all over the world, is that then we inject steam into this oil down the ground, right? So that then the viscosity lowers and then we can extract it and then we separate stream from oil. The way we've done that historically is just by burning I mean, gas to create steam, and the steam we inject it. But again, anything that, we that creates heat can be, if you have the sun, you can do with CSP. So what they've done in Oman is, okay, instead of using a gas burner to create steam, we create steam with parabolic troughs that we inject into the ground to make to, so that we can get the oil. And now you can do, I mean, it's again, it's just the same concept. It's just constant producing heat. Uh, so that brings me to, okay, that's just to uh, show you some, some projects outside there. Uh, sadly, I, I, don't, I didn't bring a newer picture. I should have, but I guess you've seen many, so. And that brings me to the actual core of the technology which you have here. So in terms of CSP, of course, a system has the collector part, the thermal conversion process, I mean, the receiver, uh, getting all the heat and converting it into useful heat, and then the conversion from heat to electricity. If you focus only on the collector part, this is the main core of parabolic trough, which is the solar collector assembly. We call it SCA. So a single solar collector assembly receives the cold fluid, and after it leaves it, then it's hot. And basically, these mirrors are shaped in this parabola sort of, such that if they are facing, if it's, I mean, this one, hopefully, if it's in the northern hemisphere, has the sun somewhere here, so the south here, so that then they can at all times just like do like this or stuff. Like it depends. I came to like, of course, you can track north, south, or east, west, or whatever decision you want. But meaning that what you do is that you track the sun into this line. Okay, the line has a fluid that enters cold, leaves hot. The structure itself has a number of components as you can see. Some are obvious, which is that it requires a lot of structure to withhold to track like all this metallic piping and so on. It's a large system or large, call, I mean, component if you compare to this person here. And there are mainly two things that are um, important when it comes to the, to the conversion process. One is the, the parabolic mirror, right? Because that's the one that reflects the energy. And the other one is the absor absorber tube or the receiver. So this is our collector, right? I mean, well, the collector, this assembly is all of this, but this is the actual mirror that reflects the energy, and this is our receiver, which is the heat collection element. Mm, let's see, okay. I don't wanna go into too much, uh, so I could spend like weeks talking about each loss, but what I want you to keep from like this, it's like for each element, for each, uh, each of this solar collector systems, right? 
we can estimate at all times what is the thermal power that they can provide, that they can deliver. If I know where the sun is and so on. And the way to do that, it's basically knowing the mirror area, knowing the actual beam radiation, which should, you now know what it means. Um, and then multiplying by a number of losses or efficiencies. One you already know, which is the cosine effectiveness, which is just like basically how good am I tracking? Because that gives me an indication of how useful is this energy. But then we have other losses in this type of systems. And there are actually more than this. These are just the main ones. One should be obvious. And I will well, just ask if you can help me here. Like, so one, we, we call it surface effectiveness, or I call it, but in reality, it could be confused with something else. But let's say surface effectiveness, which is kind of like connected to the quality of the surface. And what do I mean by quality? Can anyone like rise, rise up like, what would I mean like by the quality of this? How much I reflect? And why would I wouldn't reflect everything? Yeah, dust. So the most obvious thing is just cleanliness. Okay, how clean is this? Because if it's all full of soil, I don't reflect anything. So that's why my, the quality of my meter, even though I have a meter, if it's dirty, I don't do anything with it. On top of that, though, uh, for those who are material engineers, uh, the mirrors do not reflect everything. I mean, the light in every surface has a absorptivity, transmissivity, and reflection. Of course, we're trying when we look into mirrors, we want to get the best mirrors that increase the reflectivity part of it, that they don't transmit or absorb anything, just reflect. But I mean, there is no such a thing as a hundred percent reflective mirror. So this quality comes from like. The material, the material properties, which is like the reflectivity, a good mirror, that we, the, the ones we use on site have like reflectivity of 94%, 96%, um, and the cleanliness. Cleanliness is a factor of how, how often you clean your mirror, basically. So if you, oh, if you just leave it there, after a month, of course, this will be very important because you never cleaned it. But if you are like cleaning once a week, then this value will always be high. We're talking about this coefficient will always be like 0 0.96, 0 0.94, like all the times. Uh, cosine, you know, cosine could vary depending on the time of the day, because it's depending exactly on the position of the sun, on the way you track. The cosine could go from 30% to 70%. So it really is the one that drives the power that you can collect. We have other two that are, um, these are intuitive. So I want you to all know this, I'll, I'll come to that. And this is the least intuitive one, which is called incidence angle modifier. Again, you know now what the incidence angle is, <laughs> which is just the ratio or the relationship, the angle between the normal of my collector at some point and the position of the sun. So that angle. Now, the truth is that in this type of systems, we have a factor that kind of like corrects that because we are not, all of these points have not the same incidence angle because of this shape. And we all tie it in different points here. So then we have this factor there. And that usually goes, again, above 0 0.9. So it's not the highest, but it has an impact. And then these two are intuitive. One is called shadowing factor, and the other end loss factor. So let's see who can help me here. What's shadowing factor? Yeah, of course. If, I mean, just look at this picture. You have shadow here, right? This is picture was probably taken at solar noon, which you know what it means, right? Why is was it taken at solar noon? Because the shadow, I mean, they are all like this, right? So the, the sun was just directly south. And they were tracking probably like this. I mean, like, if the sun is there, they were tracking like east to west, like all the time, right? So we know it's like there's this, this photo was taken like at solar noon. Now, what will happen if this photo is taken at sunset? The yeah, so the shadow is somewhere like here. So maybe if the sun is here, I'm shadowing part of this mirror depending on how is the spacing in between them. So of course, at some point of the day, this factor will be critical. So maybe even if this is all shadowed, then this is all zero, because right? there's no power coming from it. But then this will only depend on, this is mainly effect, I mean, of course, it's a function of this distance. and uh, It will increase at sunset, sunrise hours. And this one is also intuitive, but I'll help you more uh, get to it. It's like what we call the end losses. Any idea of what the end losses will be? This is basically connected to, you have a collector, right? And now we know that the collector is like this thing here. 
and the sun is somewhere there, and it's doing like this, right? Well, it's actually fixing the horizon, so it's like this. If the sun is somewhere there, because I'm not in the equator, I have the sun like here, it has an angle here, and then it reflects like this, right? If I am at the end of this, what happens with my reflection? Doesn't go to the pipe. So that's why it's called like, depending on where the sun is, sometimes I have end losses, which is like I'm reflecting something, but it's not coming here. So those are like, they are all very intuitive, but that's solar energy engineering. This, are, this is optical engineering behind the notions of what, if I know this and I can estimate all of this at all times, just knowing where the sun is, I can estimate how much power a collector can give me. And if a, if a, if a parabolic trough system has, I don't know, a million collectors, then it's a million times this, theoretically. Okay? Now, um, before I jump into the other technology, what I've said is just a part of the system. This, this is just the collector part, which is like solar radiation into heat. So only this part, only this block, right? But in a power plant, this is only part of the whole picture because then once this fluid is hot, it's used either to create steam directly, right? In a heat exchanger or to be stored. So through another heat exchanger in which in parabolic trough plants we use salts to store into tanks. So if it's the hot oil coming here, cold, cold salt is going from the cold tank and the heat from the oil gets uh, passed to the cold salt so that it comes hot and then it's stored hot. When we don't have the sun, then we do the opposite. We just basically empty the hot tank, pass the cold oil so that then it gets hot and drives this, the drives the power cycle whenever we want to, through a heat exchanger. On the right here, yeah, my left, you have the power cycle, which I don't want to go into much detail because it's basically like any other power cycle. You just use the heat from the sun to create, or from the storage, to create steam. So here you have water entering at 100 degrees or something, just before it actually turns into steam. And because we have all the oil that is hot, and the oil is usually 400 degrees, then the water jumps into 400, 390, whatever, so to, to drive a steam turbine. So that's like parabolic troughs. If I talk about the other one that I want to talk about was uh, tower technology. So tower technology, um, uh, again, I'm going to show some pictures of projects there. Uh, this is similar to the Andasol one that I showed before, because this was the first commercial one. So this is uh, close to you. This is in Seville. This is a 20 megawatt electric plant with 19 hours of storage. So like 18 hours storage. It's like a lot of storage. Basically, this plant can run base load, meaning that it can continuously operate at 20 megawatt electric. Um, this plant was commissioned in 2011, and since then has had no trouble, showing us that tower technology, it's a viable technology, and it's proven now it's bankable because now you can ask for depth, I mean, finance it and so on. Um, uh, the, we will go into that, but again, you have a field of mirrors of collectors, the Shekho heliostats, they concentrate here. In a day like this where you have sun, you, don't, you cannot see here because it's bright, uh, but the receiver again is black because it has coated so that you can uh, get more energy, right? Like I said before. Um, and then here you have the power block unit, which is just a steam cycle. Um, after that one, soon after that one, then we had another project that is very iconic because this one converts directly water into steam here. So here you see how they look in reality, right? They look black. These plants are not in operation. Uh, by the way, I'm going to ask a question here. By the shape of this, I don't know if you, to see if you're following. By the shape of this, right, and you can see that the tower is not in the center, right? The tower is not in the center, it's not here, it's like here. By the shape of this, where is the south? So who say the south is, uh, the, the south is here? But this is in Spain, by the way, so who's, who, raise your hand so those of you who say that the south is here, where I am. Yeah, so the south is there, right? And it should be obvious. Why? Exactly, because here on this side now, 
my incidence angle will be lower because I always have the sunlight like this. Okay, so that's like the type of notions I want you to leave. I mean, I'm quite sure you're gonna forget everything after today, but at least you're gonna keep some of these notions, so. So um, this one, it's again coming back, one plant in California, three times 120, all of them. What is interesting about them is that unlike these ones where we had the molten salts, here it's directly water. So water is pumped up there, and there in the black box, we create steam. And the steam comes down and drives the steam turbine. There's a problem with the systems, is that we have no storage. Because there is no cost effective storage today to handle steam, to store steam directly. We're working on that. There are a couple of systems like this. One is actually being commissioned soon in Israel, without storage. Uh, and this is one of my favorites because I work in there. This was commissioned in 2015. It's in Nevada, so it's in, in eight hours, well, it's like five hours drive from Las Vegas. Um, yeah, now you know that this, 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 the south is somewhere there because more mirrors are here, right? Uh, and this is 110 megawatts scale. So it's the first one that was a really large scale because the, the, on the first one was this one, 20 megawatt, still kind of like a pilot demonstration. Now we have a tower that's been operating since 2016, sort of, with 110 megawatt. And now, uh, by the end of this year, this year, Morocco will commission the first one at 150 megawatt in what's this up? With the same concept, the same molten salts and power, power block unit or steam cycle and so on. Uh, and this one, again, is to show the, that CSP is not only for electricity, this is the same. We could use tower technology to create steam that we inject into the ground and then to lower the viscosity of the oil in a, so here is a nice photo because you have both technologies. So the steam that is generated by this is used to lower the viscosity so that this thing can get oil from the ground. But again, because CSP is about generating heat, which is the, the main core of CSP. Um, I like these ones because these ones, when, when the, this is Morocco. So I was part of the beginning uh, of, the, of the power plant construction. Now this is fully erected. And these were only the first heliostats. So this is very close to you. You see how we were only testing the first heliostats. All of the pylons are empty here. They, they don't have the, the, the mirror structure yet. And now one thing I want to look at is that a mirror a heliostat, first of all, is huge. So look at us here, right? And look at the heliostat. When you look at this picture, they look like minimum. Now these heliostats in particular, I think here, the ones in Noor are like 134 meters square. So it's like a big apartment, each of them moving, right? And then if you look carefully, they are made of different mirrors. So it's not just like one 130 square meter mirror. It's like many what we call facets. And if you had a microscope, you will see that they are not flat. They all create a small parable that you cannot differentiate with the eye, but they all are specifically positioned so that they can have an image like this one point. Because if they were not curved, they would just direct everywhere, right? So we, we, we designed them such that they have an image like this, so that we can control how each of them should look, where should it look here, so that I don't burn this. And that's the whole engineering in towers. Um, uh, I also like this, oh, the building in the tower is huge. I mean, like, again, if here's a person here. We're talking about this is only I think far from being terminated, I mean like the tower is 250 meters square, uh, 50 meters, sorry, length here in Morocco, so you see it. If you are in Ouachasat today, it's beautiful because first of all, it's always clear sky, but second, you see this tower from everywhere now, so because it's the only building in Ouachasat, so it's, it's really nice. And this I like because you see what, it gives you an idea of what are the conditions these systems are exposed to. We have here, while putting our first helistats, we had a tornado. So you see the tornado there, and like, we're just like, okay, we cannot do anything for some minutes. And this will happen not only during construction, but in operation. And you know that this means that all these structures, which, by the way, here you can see the two actuators, so that means that it can move like this, but also, in, I mean like, like this, but also like this. <laughs> um, all of these structures and the actuators and the way they're built need to withstand that. Like they need to li like support, like 
pass through these conditions for 30 years, which is what they were designed for. Okay? Uh, and this will happen all the time. All not only this will mean that this could damage the structure, but also, of course, this will make this, this helistats uh, dirty. I mean, there's a lot of soil here. This is just dust. So cleaning and so on. So you have an idea of what are the real conditions on the site. Uh, and not to mention, uh, this was Ramadan, by the way. So this is like, none of them were drinking water. So I, I didn't understand it. I, I'm, I'm not Muslim, but I was like, this was so hot here. <laughs> like, during construction. I felt really sorry. I was drinking water, like, in the car. Um, but the basics, so now you know how they look like. And these are the real basics. So we have our massive heliostat structure which you saw here before, yeah? Am I late? At 11? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, let's do it here, before this one, okay. Since we're very late, <laughs> uh, so we have these massive structures that collect the light into the, this point. Now, one thing that I haven't asked that at this point should be obvious, and maybe I don't have the time to ask, but I, I'm going to do it. It's like, what is the useful radiation in a CSP plant? Now, you know radiation can be decomposed in diffuse and beam. Which is the one that's useful? The beam, because it's the only one that I can control where to direct, because the other one comes from everywhere. So CSP plants are only built in locations where the beam is good, where we have no clouds. Like, what's that? Whereas PV can take energy from every component, from the beam and the diffuse. So in Sweden, we have PV, because who cares? It's cheap and we have light, OK? Just keep that notion. Again, the helistat looks like this. We saw it before in the real picture. It's a massive structure. If I stand up, I look like this square box here. Uh, they reflect. They need to have high reflectivity. I said before, no mirror is 100% reflective but they need to have a high reflectivity. High optical precision, which is kind of less what I was talking before, they are curved, they are aiming at specific points, and that we can measure through what we call slope errors, which is errors at the, at the facet. I mean, if, if the, if the helicer has like a small like, burp or stuff, of course it will aim somewhere else. And also tracking errors, because there's an error in the way this is like, if, if I tell this to track to a specific point, and it, it's a bit off, that damages all my control. So all of this needs to be very accurate. And they need to be resistant, because I showed you before, they're exposed to tornadoes all the time, even there in what's that, where it's a rock desert. It's not even a sand desert, because in sand deserts, it's even worse. Um, and before we go then on the QA question, uh, just this, which is what we go, went through the uh, trough. Again, now, for every helistat, I can calculate how much power I can deliver to the receiver, which is just the, this component there, right? And I can do it this way. Uh, the notion is the same. So the area, or the mirror area of the helistat, times the beam radiation, times the number of coefficients or losses, right? The main loss we know now, cosine. Cosine, again, I mean, here we're not tracking. If you look at them, this will be, what is the incidence angle? If you know now, it's like the normal of my surface to the sun, which is the same as the normal to the where I'm reflecting. Since I am reflecting to a single point in tower technology, even though I have two tracking like angles, the incidence is not zero because this is not moving. This is always there. So I always have some cosine losses. So that's the main one for every system. Surface effectiveness is the same as before. How clean, how reflective my mirrors are. And then we have shadowing, which is also obvious. I mean, if you have this, and the sun is here, and this shadows this one, this delivers no energy. We have um, blocking, which is the contrary. Let's say, for instance, if the sun is too high, and I'm very far, or I don't know if this is going to work, but if I'm like this, and then this reflects, but then gets blocked by this, then of course, part of the reflection is lost. It doesn't hit there. So now you know these two ones. And these are very key for solar tower because they're only for solar towers. One is attenuation loss, which I wanted to remember. Um, that happens after the reflection. Uh, attenuation is because, if you look at, again, this field. So we have all the problems of like, or cosine effectiveness, surface effectiveness, right? Before the light hits my collector. Once the light hits my collector, 
I could have blocking if one mirror blocks my other one, right? If the light is blocked. But another one that is key, and it's key because it limits the size of this, is attenuation, which is that for the furthermost away point, the light has to go from here to here. And what we know what happens with atmospheric effects. Of course, atmospheric effects is like kilometers, right? From here to the, to the atmosphere. But here's the same. We're exposing the light again from here to here to more dust, to more particles, which means that the quality of my reflection from a mirror that is further away, it's lower than for a mirror that is here. Just if I look at attenuation laws. So that's the notion of attenuation. And then the last one is spillage, which I can show quickly why this. Maybe I can aim here. So it means that I'm spilling the energy. My control is wrong. A spillage is not necessarily an error. It's actually probably part of the operation. Depending on the, how hot this is, if you are starting, if you are ramping, and so on, you might induce a spillage. You might not want all the energy to be in the receiver. But at the end, it's energy that is lost. So that's why it's a loss. If you look at, so if I know this, I can calculate the power that each of this gives me. Because I know the position for all of them, and the position of the sun, and the position of the tower. And uh, if I look from a year perspective, I can calculate from, uh, if I'm really doing computational, I mean, a design of the system, I don't want to do this all, all times, one by one. I can do this for a, from a field only. If I know the position of the sun, you know, you know the elevation from 0 to 90, so from 0 to 90, azimuth from plus 180, minus 180. I can estimate what is the collector, um, what is the solar field efficiency, meaning that multiplying only this value, whatever, 40%, 60%, times the area, times the beam irradiance, gives me how much power it gets to the receiver. But to do that, of course, I need to do a lot of computational analysis for each of these heliostats at each time, at each minute or so on. But let's say I did it, so then all you need, then you can build this type of matrices where, uh, again, if I know that the azimuth, by the way, what is this? Solar moon, right? So you see that solar noon, our field efficiency, if it's well designed, reaches its maximum efficiency, which is somewhere around, I don't know, red, 70 something. Like a good efficiency, like at good points of the day, like the best points of the day, the best efficiencies are always reached at solar noon, if you look at the red area here, no matter if it's uh, winter or if it's summer. Um, uh, well, that's just what I wanted to say. And you see like solar azimuth and zenith, or elevation, it's just the same as talking about time. This is 6, 6 a.m., 7 p.m., and so on. This is how a receiver actually looks like. So you have there, when we were commissioned in Nevada, how it actually looks behind the, the heat exchanger. It's just a massive heat exchanger. Uh, from a system perspective, then it looks like this. Again, everything I've said is only this. But this fluid gets hot to be stored to then drive a power cycle. That it's just a conventional steam cycle. Okay, so let's go to the questions and then I'll continue this later. Let's see. Here? No. Um, no. Storms? Or, oh. So we need to go really back. Let's see where we are. <laughs> um, okay. Awesome presentation. Thank you. Uh, I forgot what we call the particles that are moving in the atmosphere and causing the reduction of radiation received by the Earth. Well, I mean, there is no such a, a single name for that. It's literally, it could be sand, it could be dust. So even like, if you look, the atmosphere is charged, with, it's humid. So even there are water particles in it. And of course, if the light goes to water particles, even if you don't see it with the eyes, the quality of the light, is, uh, it gets reduced. Um, can you mention, please, one concept of the CSP technology? Uh, uh, there are many. I mean, first, the one that should be obvious to you is how complex it is compared to PV. I mean, uh, your PV system, 
You put it on the rooftop, you forget about it. Your CSP system, you have trackable devices that you need to clean that convert um, whatever fluid to like energy to a hot fluid. So you have a hot fluid that is actually sometimes flammable. So you don't want to have that on top of your house and so on. So there are different cons and pros for each other. And one obvious one is the cost. I mean, like CSP today is more costly than PV if you only look at dollar per megawatt hour and you don't care when it's produced. Uh, combining CSP and PV, could it give better results? Yes, indeed. I mean, then you have a cheap technology during the daytime, you store during the daytime, and produce with CSP in the nighttime, right? So Morocco is doing that in a project called Numidelt. We see the results from that tender later this year. Electricity created by PV could be storage with any technology we want, not batteries only. Yeah, that's true. I mean, you could use electricity, and then basically if you use the electricity to heat something with resistances, then you can have like some heat storage, right? It's just that that's less efficient. And that's why the answer for CSP, why CSP valuable is not because storage is cheap, it's because cost effective. I mean, the efficiency of something you store like in these tanks, if we stop the plant on a Monday, I'm quite sure next Monday we have the same temperature. Just to have an idea of how efficient the system is. The reason why though, is because they are very well insulated and because they are massive. If you were only having, I mean, at, at, at home, I, when I was living back in Venezuela, sometimes you will not have water, right? And then you will have like, uh, or, 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 or the electricity will be missing or so on. So the, the, the heater will not always be there. So at homes, you will have like these water tanks. Of course, the efficiency of those tanks is, low, is lower because they are small, small tanks that are not necessarily well insulated. They are like just water at 40 degrees and on some days later they are at 20. I mean, if you don't do anything, right? Uh, here we're not talking about it. I mean, CSP systems have very cost, of cost efficient, from a technical point of view, storage. Are the large scale which is more efficient and land use in terms of energy to land area ratio? CSP or PV? It depends on what you want to. Uh, I'm, I mean, pff, this is a hard question to answer, but you could say both are more or less the same uh, in terms of land requirements. But again, one is to produce energy in the night or during dispatchable, the other is not. Here in Noor, we only can store the energy for three hours maximum, but it may reach 13 hours. An explanation. Uh, well, it's just a matter of design. I mean, the, the, the system in, in NUR 1 was sized to provide power for three hours at the nominal capacity, which was uh, 160, right, Yishra, the first NUR 1. So if you depleted the tank completely, you can run for three hours without, without the sun, if the tank is full. But that was a decision of design. And I mean, and that's because that's what the tender requirements, I mean, the government wanted a system that provides three. If you look at the next NUR, uh, in the NUR complex uh, in Guasasad, we have now four NUR plants, right? The first one is the one with three hour storage. The other, the other two CSP ones have seven and nine hours of storage. And then uh, we have a PV one with no storage. So like, it really depends, it's a matter of design. Uh, and we will actually talk about it uh, later. Gracias por su presentación. ¿Cuál es su política sobre So I guess I'll do it in, so it is just saying that what is my opinion what, about the policies, renewable energy policies in Morocco? I think, uh, I mean, first of all, I, I work close to my sense, so <laughs> I say I like it. <laughs> but I, I think, I mean, I think Morocco is doing the right thing. I mean, a country that doesn't have the fossil fuel resources needs to move fast and transition fast into renewable resources. There's no option. A country like Saudi Arabia or Venezuela, or whatever, with a lot of fossil fuel resources, of course it makes sense that we use our fossil fuel resources, but we just do it smartly. We use them to transition to solar energy and so on. In Morocco, I mean, I think betting for CSP and PV very early, it, it was the right decision. Um, can you please remind us why do we have this gap between the helistats in the first picture? Page 28. Uh, I'll come to that later, I hope. But let's just move quickly. So I'm, they're going to come to me and like, you're taking too long. What do you think about, well, uh, what do you think about cool solar? Uh, I don't get the question, but I think solar is cool. If that's the question. <laughs> but I guess it's about cooling, like devices, like using solar energy to cool. Uh, it's not exactly what I do, but of course you can have absorption chillers, which is basically through um, these fluids, uh, a refrigerant, then you can like basically just uh, have a refrigerant cycle. And I mean, I think uh, I don't work with them, so my impression is just that they are viable, but uh, probably they are not there out everywhere because they are not cost effective. That's the whole thing. What do you mean by cosine effectiveness? I really didn't want this question because I hope that's the only thing you capture from this, but 
So cosine effectiveness is basically how good am I positioning myself as a surface with regards to where the sun is. Because if my normal vector from the surface is away from the sun, then I have an angle in between them that I call the incidence angle, right? If I have an incidence angle, then I'm not using in the best way all the energy that I can get from the sun. I should be just facing the sun. Um, it's kind of like if I want to get tan and the sun is there, I will only get tan this side, right? So like, yeah, if I want to do it smartly, I'll just look at the sun. So like, that's kind of that notion. Um, there are reasons why, though, we cannot avoid that. I mean, there are reasons why there will be losses from a cosine effectiveness in all these tracking devices. Like, that's what I was explaining before. How many kilowatt hour we can store with CSP drop? And for how much hour can we? The same question for tower. Uh, well, uh, again, this is a decision. Uh, we can play with that in the simulation uh, after afterwards in the late, at the end of the day. But this is a decision factor. I mean, you could, you could decide to have a 20 megawatt steam turbine, which is relatively small steam turbine, and a very massive field of 1.5 uh, million meter square area of mirror, and then store for 18 hours, like literally. You have a lot of energy coming in and then produce 20 megawatt at all times. But maybe what the system requires, I mean, what the, government, what the country requires, is not 20 megawatts at all times, but 200 megawatts at the single hour. You could have the same size of mirrors, like 1.5 million meters square again, but have a turbine that is 200 megawatt and operate for one hour. So the, the decision of how much you want to store, how much you want to produce, it's a ratio of what the system needs. Uh, we can design systems for depending on what we, what we need. Is an altitude um, can make, yes, it can. Why, why is altitude um, could make a difference? Closer to the sun, less attenuation, less atmospheric effects. That's the main reason why. In Chile, we have the best DNI, and it's, you know, like, it's not a coincidence. The best DNI in the world is at 3,000, I mean, like in, in the desert of Atacama, which is very high. There's also an ozone hole, which is the reason why. <laughs> but it's like, it's a combination of. Um, how does the second turbine work if steam water loses the pressure in the first amount? Why we use the turbines? Uh, well, I mean, this is not mainly connected to only this, but in power cycles, a steam turbine has um, different um, stages, exactly. So what, what, what you see too, it's not that there are two, it's just the same steam turbine. It's just that it's varying in pressure. So you have the high pressure, the intermediate pressure, the low pressure, at least, typically. But I mean, in all these systems actually, in Gemma Solar, in, um, here in Noor, the system has seven stages. So you're talking about like multiple pressures that are uh, taken from, from which water is taken at different stages. Material of the receiver, we talk about it, what the system who moves the collector in two directions is called. Um, well, this is just a tracking device. So depending on which um, tracking system you use, these are just simple actuators, as the ones you will use for any other robotic thing. Like, you know, like, you just program them, and they will just move depending on the angles. No specific name for them. Um, how can we choose the orientation of a solar power plant for a specific site? If we know the angles, then you can define where do you want your surface to look at, where do you want the light to be reflected to, so that's basically the whole uh, concept here. How far away can we put the latest heliostat? This is a tricky question. One of the things is knowing, so far I've only mentioned that we, we calculate the, the solar energy, right? Using the parallel heliometer, pyranometer, and so on. In tower plants, another device that is key, it's a device that calculates visibility, which all the airports have. So if you go to an airport, every airport calculates visibility, which is like, how far can we see? For someone, the notion of visibility is like for someone standing in the horizon, like me as an observer, how many kilometers can, I, can my view see perfect? Until which point I can distinguish something. So of course, in a tower system, the better the visibility, the better the efficiency of the system is. Visibility can be measured at all times uh, by equipment as well, uh, but this is not so common. Only airports have it, and airports, uh, only lie, only take care of if it reaches 10 kilometers. Because if it's if the visibility is 10 kilometers or more, airplanes are allowed to land. So that's all they care. But in CSP plans, a 10 kilometer visibility is actually bad. So in a real good site, uh, a tower plant is built at a 30 kilometer visibility or so, 
which means that we don't have the data for that. And it's that, that's one of the issues there. And depending on that value, the visibility, coming back to the question, we can estimate how far away can the helistat be before the losses from attenuation are too high. Uh, at the picture, which you ask about why we don't put the tower in the middle, so why we don't put our old helistat face to south side better than some mirrors face to north? Yeah, and you have systems where they're all south. It's a matter of optimizing. I mean, attenuation or, I mean, cosine, sorry, cosine loss is not the only loss. You saw all these other losses. So sometimes it actually pays better to have a few in the north as well than having all in the south. Because the, the loss, the cosine loss is only one of all the losses I've saw before. Uh, normally, a minimum distance of three meters is left between the rows of PTC. Is it enough to avoid it? Uh, this is not true. Um, the, the, rowing, I mean, the rowing space could be even up to 50 meters. It really depends on the geometry we're talking about. And in some collectors, the width goes to 10 meters, which means, of course, that you want to keep this more or less the same width of the collector as a row space in between. Uh, how can we calculate the solar multiple? We will come to that today. Um, can we store steam? We can store steam in what we call steam accumulators, but these are inefficient and costly. We're talking about components that if you store steam directly, then you are imagining steam is very highly pressurized. You're talking about highly pressurized steam, like um, tanks, in which at minutes, this steam will become saturated, so it will become water. So they are very, from a cost efficient point of view, inefficient. So that's why we don't have storage in direct steam generation, even though we have steam, uh, steam accumulators. And we just got a question. Can we rely on solar energy 100% in soon future? No. I mean, that, that you should know. I mean, we, we need to have a combination of resources. And some areas of the world will have, will be maybe 100% solar, but some won't. And even those are that are very good solar, they also have other resources that they should mix because, I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, even in application, I mean, like if you look at, well, you know all this earth, sun geometry and so on. I mean, and sun, I mean, the solar energy, even though reliable, because we know that it will always be there, is unreliable in the way that when it will be there. So we need to have a combination of different resources. Um, I think that was the last question. So, <laughs> thanks. Yeah. Oh, that's great. <laughs>